Before I start, I want to thank you guys again for your worship. It was just a joy. So uh, thank you for sharing your gifts with us. I recorded that uh, Hawaiian version of the doxology on my phone and played it last night a dozen times. I just love it. It was just amazing. So thanks for that. Also, thanks to everybody here who's been serving us so well with donuts and donuts and donuts and swimming and fun and laughter. Can we just give a hand to the team that has done that? It's just so great. And then we'll get started in a minute, but I'm a terrible marketer and I forgot to send the thing to the bookstore, so I don't have any books here, but I want you to know what is available. Um, the book on the far left is called Forest Faith. It's a book about the biblical concept of meditation. These are all available on Amazon. The book called Breathing New Life into Faith is about spiritual disciplines. The book entitled The Map is Not the Journey is about the lessons learned when I was on sabbatical and took a hike from uh, Italy to Austria to Germany to Switzerland back to Austria through the Alps with my wife. Close of Hope is about one verse in the Bible, Micah 6, 8. What does the Lord require of you? Really, through only three things. Do justice, love mercy, walk humbly with God. What does that mean? Um, that book, I think of all of them, was uh, writing it and living into it was most transformational for me. But, you know, all those things are important and available as resources. And then also in my retirement, my semi-retirement, I started a YouTube page where I'm trying to reach people who have kind of said no to institutional Christianity but are still interested in Jesus. And so that page is uh, on YouTube. I make these myself. Uh, if you recall, there's six questions that uh, we need to answer in formation work. Only four of them are covered this week. The other two are on this channel. And, and uh, so if you want to look at that sometime, you're welcome to do so also. And then if we go on to the next slide, uh, we're going to talk about what habits do we need to build into our lives in order to allow the fullness that is ours to, you know, be displayed in the world. And the guy who is our guide on this one is the Apostle Paul. Paul's amazing to me. His conversion story is amazing. His life is amazing. But I think, uh, you know, when I look at him, I see there's a, there's a peak in the Cascades up near me called El Dorado. And when you get to the top, the... the the ridge is about a foot wide and drops off on a, either side at about a 60-degree 60, 60 angle, two to 3,000 feet. So you don't want to fall, right? You got to walk on this ridge. And I always I think about how uh, we're called by Jesus to be in the world, but what? Not of the world. And how easy it is to fall off on one side or the other. In fact, I would argue that we all fall off on one side or the other right? If we're left-leaning, then we're really good at being in the world, and also we allow kind of the values and structures and priorities of the culture to define us, and now we're in the world and of the world. You know, and if we're, you know, fundamentalists and zealot, we withdraw from the world, and now we have our own values, but we built a wall of fear around us, and we're not really doing that well anyway, and so Within those walls, there's our own hypocrisy and shame and sense of failure. And so we're not in the world, and we're not of the world, but we're also not in it, right? And so you've got these, this challenge, how do I live here? And I think Paul shows us how to do that. And you find his capacity to do that articulated in his biography in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. This is where Paul says this. <coughs> He says, though I'm, verse 19 of 1 Corinthians 9, though I'm free from all men, I made myself a slave to all so that I might win more. To the Jews, I've become Jewish so that I might win Jews. Those under the law, as under the law, though not being myself under the law, so that I might win those under the law. In other words, here's Paul. When I'm with the Galatian church, which is predominantly Jewish, and prone toward legalism, I'm going to move them toward liberty, but I'm going to move them toward liberty by using the law 
of the Old Testament to move them. And so when you read Galatians, he's appealing to the Old Testament all the time, right? And then he says, to the Greeks, I become a Greek so that I might win the Greeks. What does that mean? Well, if you go to Acts 17, you know, Paul's waiting for his buddies. Uh, he's at the airport, if we could say it that way. And, and there's this Mars Hill uh, in Athens. And, you know, he looks at all the statues there. And he's, it says that he carefully read the inscriptions of all the statues. And some of these statues, I don't know if you've been there, they're downright pornographic. I mean, you know, phallic images, it's idolatry. And here's Paul, you know, wandering among the idols, reading these things. Why? So that he can be conversant with the Greeks. And then he ends up uh, invited to speak in the town square. And, you know, he doesn't start with this. Idol worshipers, you're headed for hell. You know, and he pulls out a repent sign. He, what does he do? He says, hey, guess what? You guys are religious in every way. Like he builds a bridge. And he says, in fact, I was looking at all your inscriptions, and I see that you even have an inscription to the unknown God. I have good news. The God that you don't know, I happen to know that God. And then watch this. Using not the Old Testament, not the New Testament, not even the sayings of Jesus, Using Greek poetry, he uses Greek poetry to articulate and defend the gospel. Who does that? Someone who can be in, but not of the world, right? So, I, you know, I want to be that person. I want to be able to be with you, and I want to be able to go to uh, places that are pretty red and be there, and I want to be able to be in my church in Seattle and in every place call people to the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. Because that's all that matters in the end. Not our political affiliations, not our you know, peripheral views on this or that, but the, the, what Paul calls the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. How do, so then I ask the question, how does Paul <coughs> do that? And uh, here's the answer. He says, don't you know, 24, 1 Corinthians 9, don't you know that everybody who runs in a race runs, but only one receives the prize? Run, therefore, in such a way that you may what? Win. Who's competitive in the room? Anybody? Some of, some of you are. I'm always afraid I'm going to lose. So I'd rather not play. You know? I'll size you up, and if I think I can beat you, I'm in, but if, I, if I'm intimidated, I'm like, oh, my Achilles is bothering me. I'm sorry. I'd love to beat you up today, but I just can't, right? And, you know, Paul is saying something here. He's saying, take that, take that desire you have to, you know, be the best and recognize that desire isn't necessarily born of pride. It's a gift from God if channeled properly. Run so that you may what? Get an also competed green ribbon? You know, run to win. This has been Mike's thing all, every evening. All in. I'm all in. Well, so my desire today is to help you be all in when you leave here. Because you and I both know, especially if you've been here more than once, it's way easier to be all in here than when you leave here, right? When I'm here, I think I'm pretty much all in. I get fed by another speaker. I get blessed by worship. There isn't a conversation that doesn't thrill me. And the fellowship is incredible around the table. The conversations are beautiful. You know, we all love Jesus. We set our differences aside, you know. It, it, and it's wonderful. These redwoods are my, my home growing up. It's the safest place on the planet. I tell people, when I was a kid, this is the place. This is my Mecca. This is my holy place. This is my Jerusalem. I love it. And then, you know, I get to San Jose, and I get to Seattle, and then I land, and then, the, you know, the van is late to pick me up to take me to the parking thing, and then the traffic on 405 is ridiculous, even on a Saturday, and I'm like this, who are all these people? 
And why are they on my freeway? I've got to get to Costco, Trader Joe's, go buy my milk, get pets, you know, treats for the dog at the other place there, and all in, you know, Issaquah. And I got to get home. And now I've got guests because somebody has COVID and the whole family came to stay with us. And I'm not sure I want them there. And before I'm home, I'm already bummed, right? So, like, how, how can we sustain what God has begun here is kind of how I want to close this thing out. Because God started good stuff. With Mike, I hope God's used what I've had to share as well. How do you do that? And the answer is in what I call soil care for the soul. So, uh, let's not go to the next slide just yet. Let's go back. And we're going to talk about the parable of seed and the sower. And that says Mark 8, it's wrong. It's Mark 4. But if you turn to Mark 4, watch, this is really interesting to me. In Mark 4, this is what we learn. There's two parables of seed and the sower. We know one of them pretty well. The guy who goes out and scatters seed. We'll look at that in a minute. But in <clears throat> chapter 4, verse 26, this is what Jesus says. The kingdom of God is like a man who casts seed upon the soil. And then he goes to bed at night, the farmer does. The seed sprouts and grows. How? He himself does not know. The soil produces crops. Watch this. The soil produces crops by itself. First the blade, then the head, then the mature grain in the head. And the crop comes, puts a sickle, harvest has come. Here's the, here's the point of this little you know, this little passage right here. Uh, God does the work in you. Uh, the seed has been planted in you, and to this point, the seed is fine. In fact, you know, what's the seed? <laughs> Get this. The seed is 1 John 3, 9, which, let me, just, let me just read this for you for just a second here, because I find it, you know, remarkable uh, particularly in my, my NASB Bible, which has got this really wooden literal translation. Listen to this. 1 John 3, 9. No one who's born of God practices sin because God's seed abides in him. And then watch this. He cannot sin because he's born of God. Wait. Did I read that right? He cannot sin. That's what my Bible says. He cannot sin. Richard, you're a heretic, man. It says in the same book, 1 John 1, 8. I preached it yesterday. If we say we have no sin, we make God a liar. And now you're telling me I cannot sin. I didn't say you could not sin. I said the seed planted in you cannot sin. Because what's the seed that's planted in you? Oh, hello. The seed that's planted in you is the resurrected Jesus who cannot sin. And he lives in you desiring to express his life through you on a daily, moment-by-moment -moment basis. And to the extent that we allow the seed to do the work that the seed needs to do, all will be well. So watch this. Everyone in the room, if Christ lives in you, if you've said yes, and if you haven't, you should. <laughs> but if Christ lives in you, you've got some pretty good seed, right? Seed that has the capacity to change the world. This perfect display of joy and strength and justice and generosity and peace and hope and mercy and truth lives in you. So here's the thing. If there's problems in our lives, and there are, let's just start with this. Don't blame the seed. Don't blame, the, don't blame God. Somebody gets cancer and suddenly we wonder about God. Ugly stuff happens in Jesus' name, and it does. Racism, colonialism, slavery, domestic violence. Don't blame the seed. Because what we're learning in Mark 4 is this. The problem is never the seed, ever. In both this parable, in verse 26, and the previous parable that we'll look at in a minute here, in, uh, uh, you know, verse 1 of Mark 4. The problem is never the seed. The only problem is what? The soil. Oh, by the way, who's responsible for the soil? The farmer. 
And who's the farmer in this parable? Take out your phone, put on reverse photo, click a thing. I'm the farmer, right? Like you're responsible for the soil that is your soul. And so if you do the proper uh, soil care, the seed will thrive. This is, this, what this does is it sets up for us like an understanding of Philippians 2, which says what? Hey, uh, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is, a, it is God who is at work within you, right? This verse like confounds many people in, the, in my torchbearer community because people in the torchbearer community often are like this. You know, Christ lives in me. Christ has to do all the work. I can't do anything apart from him. So I'm going to lay in bed unless, and then unless Jesus magically, you know, wakes me up, elevates me, sends me to the shower, opens my Bible, proclaims it to me, like I can't do anything, and at least in passivity. Hey, <laughs> here we go. Work out your salvation. What does that mean? Care for the soil. Oh, it's all up to me. No, it's not. You can care for the soil till the cows come home, as my grandpa used to say. But unless there's seed in the soil, nothing's going to happen. And there are people, believe me, who are care for the soil. Like, just type self-help books into Amazon and watch three million books come up. That's everybody working hard to, to fix the soil so they can live a meaningful life. But you, like, soil... To do what it's made to do needs what? Seed. So I need to care for the soil. That's my part. But caring for the soil will never be enough. I need the seed that is Christ. And so then we go, okay, okay, I'm with you, I'm with you. What does it mean, care for the soil? Well, now we go to the next slide. And here's what we find from the story in Mark 4. First principle, the soil is variable. I mean, the story is this. There's some soil utterly responsive. There's some soil that never, the, the seed never thrives because it's polluted by aversion to suffering. And some soil is choked by, you know, worries and addictions to pleasure and riches and that kind of thing. So let's just unpack these real briefly. And we'll, you know, we'll blow through this and we'll look at how can we care for the soil. So first of all, we look at the first one. Some soil is utterly unresponsive, right? In other words, you know, all through history, there are people who have kind of adamantly rejected declaration of the gospel. Just adamantly. Nope, not interested, right? I encounter this often just because I'm a pastor. I'm sure Mike does too. You know, you meet people on an airplane, and as soon as they find out what you do, A, they stop swearing, B, they put their vodka martini under their tray, you know, and C, they say, oh, yeah, you know, I went to church when I was a kid, but, you know, and no longer, no more, you know, and then uh, you, know, you hear this whole thing, whatever. I want to suggest to you, that's a form of unresponsiveness, but be careful here that the umbrella of, un, like the poster child of unresponsiveness in the Bible is not Christopher Hitchens the atheist. In the Bible, the most unresponsive people are people who are close to this stuff. Like who read Bibles and sing songs. But when it gets a little too personal, you know, they're not, then they're not interested. I mean, you know, Jesus comes on the scene and immediately... He's wildly popular with who? Needy people. Like, remember yesterday my story, the AA ground, you know, oh, that's us. They're, they're fine. You know, they're hanging on every word. And then, you know, meanwhile, who's stroking their beards going, hey, wait a minute, who is this guy? Well, it's the, religion, it's the seminary students and the, and, the, and, the, and the pastors. They're like, this. oh, oh, wait, this is Mark 2. Just read it sometime and underline, why does he? It's like it just keeps showing up. Why does he heal on the Sabbath? Why does he hang out with sinners? Why do John's disciples fast and he doesn't fast? 
How dare him think that he can forgive sins? And then, you know, it just goes on. The animosity grows and grows and grows. Come to John 9. And like Jesus heals a guy born blind from birth. And instead of the religious leaders going, wow, this, this is evidence of, you know, maybe he's the Messiah. Instead, they pull the guy aside. Were you really blind? Are you kidding? This is all, you know, it's like, it's like the illusionist on Monday. How'd you do that? And then the guy goes, listen, I don't know. I don't know. All I know that is this guy, I was blind, now I see. And his name's Jesus. I think he's the Messiah. And then the religious leaders are like this. Who do you think you are? Where'd you go to school? Fresno State? <laughs> I'm from Princeton, man. Get out of here. And they, they kick him out. That's rejection. Rejection culminates in John 11. Jesus raises a man from the dead, and the Pharisees and scribes get together and say, well, this proves it. He must die. Not this proves that he's the Messiah. This proves that he must die. Why? Watch this. Like we build, like we like Jesus, but, you know, growing up around Jesus sometimes is kind of this industrial religious complex in which, you know, our identity and our tribe, and for some of us our livelihood is attached. And if God really wants to actually break through and bring you closer to him, it may cost you some of that tribalism, some of that livelihood, some of that institutionalism, and you're like this, no! <laughs> I'd rather be religious, thank you. So that then in Acts 7, Stephen is speaking because, you know, Gentiles are coming to the church a little bit, and the Jewish people who were the original establishment were like, can, can Gentiles be here in the temple? And Stephen says, well, the, you know, the temple days are going to be gone soon. So now he's on trial, Stephen. And then what, is, what does Stephen say? At the, the summary of Stephen's sermon in Acts 7, I'll just save your time here. He goes, hey, you guys had a hard time with Moses. <laughs> you know, you rejected his leadership. And then you rejected the prophets and the prophets and the prophets and the prophets. And then his summary statement, what prophet didn't you reject? It's a rhetorical question. You rejected all of them. And now you're rejecting Jesus the Messiah. And, 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 and so then, he says, you guys are hard of heart and you never listen. This just cracks me up in the, in the Bible. What's their response to the accusation? You never listen. What do they do? It says, so they covered their ears and then they drove him out of the temple and they picked up rocks and they killed him. You never listen. Oh yeah, I'll show you. Who does that? Um, Hard-hearted people. Hebrews is written to believers, calling them to maturity. And what does God say in Hebrews 3? Today, you know, Friday, June, whatever it is. Is it June? July. <laughs> Friday, July, whatever it is. Today, if you hear God's voice, don't harden your heart. If God is calling you today to take one step toward wholeness, Whatever that step is, then take it. Because if you don't, God keeps speaking, but the soil is getting harder. And if we take that into then the ear metaphor, you're, you're going to get a little hard of hearing. So tomorrow God will still speak, but the voice won't be as loud to you. And the next day a little softer, softer, softer. Until pretty soon, here's what happens. You don't hear it anymore. Religious? Yeah, you may still be here. Transformed? No. Fruitful? No. So some soil is utter, utterly unresponsive. Second, some soil is polluted by aversion to affliction or persecution. In uh, 417... It says, the soil that fell in the rocky places, these are people who hear the word, receive with joy, but because they don't get rooted, they fall away. And, and then, uh, 
that's interpreted for us as, uh, the, uh, as uh, aversion to affliction and persecution, right? So these are people who, when they, 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 when they, like, at first, I'm all in because Jesus died for me. And so now I'm able to appropriate kind of that substitutionary atonement and say, isn't it great that someone took a bullet for me? He died so I don't have to. He suffered so I don't have to. But then, you know, the road of discipleship uh, leads to the eventual realization that we're called not to uh, vicariously appropriate the life of Jesus, but to live in union with the life of Jesus. Jesus himself said it, hey, if I suffer, you're going to suffer too. If they hated me, they're, they're going to hate you too. If I had to, deny, to deny myself, you're going to have to deny yourself too. So now when it becomes a matter of union, I have a cross. And if I have a cross, uh, thanks, no, I don't think so. I'll be religious, but I'm not, I, no, the cross, is, I, I don't want to do that. Rwanda was like the, it was the mission's success story in 1990. Our church does a lot of work in Rwanda, so I know this. 90% claiming faith in Christ. And then, you know, in the mid-90s, the Hutu majority, you know, plotted a scheme of genocide for the Tutsi minority. So, you know, here in one week, Hutu and Tutsi worshiping the other, just like we did, singing songs, just like we did. In the next week, Hutus killing fellow church members. One Hutu pastor inviting Tutsis into his building for shelter and then barring the doors and lighting a church on fire. We were just singing these songs. How does that happen? Well, you know, in the post-genocide reconciliation movement, what you come to discover is many people didn't want to kill their neighbors, but they knew that if they didn't kill their neighbors, uh, th these Hutus w would kill their family in front of their eyes and then kill them. Not easy. But the thing that you and I need to embrace is this. And uh, Mike articulated beautifully last night with, his, with his, uh, the story of the pets on the beach and the kids who aren't worried. Listen, the, I'm going to tell you this. There's only one safe place to be on this planet, and that's yoked with your creator, with Jesus. It's the only safe place. May it kill you early. Sophie Scholl died at 23 for resisting the Reich. You know, MLK was arrested, who may, I don't know how many times, and his house bombed. People suffer for being the prince of Jesus, it happens. But your point isn't to seek suffering. Your point isn't to avoid suffering. Your point is to be yoked with Jesus. Where you go, I'll go. Because that's the only safe place to be. My version of Mike's story, uh, I was climbing once in Austria, and uh, uh, it's fall, and a shepherd is bringing sheep down from the high country, which my wife has done as well with a friend's Austrian friends who own a farm. But I'm climbing and the sheep come down and I, you know, I had never seen sheep so I want to see them. So I, I had my belayer, you know, lower me and I came down and I, I started walking over to the sheep. It's a picture of a, you know, flock. And I walk over and I go, hey sheep, boom, they took off. They were terrified, man. And so then the shepherd from the back seeing the idiot American, uh, he starts running toward a sheep. He says one word. They come right to him. And then he goes to the front, and then the sheep follow him down the hill. And I stand aside. And I watch, because I'm right at the edge of town on a climbing wall. I watch. They come down. And in this little town, Schladming, where I teach, there's a pedestrian mall. And the sheep go, I mean, they were terrified of one little voice. Now, they walk onto the pedestrian mall. You know, there's an Austrian Oompa band playing. You know, people are doing folk dancing with beers. Straight through. No fear. Why? All I need 
All I need, the shepherd said. What do you need to sleep at night? Bomb-proof financial security? Good locks on the doors? More guns? Like, what do you need? Some soil is choked by worries. This is really interesting. Because the word worry is one of my favorite Greek words in the Bible, in the, in the Greek language. The Greek word is merimnao, and what it means is our heart is divided. A word has a divided heart. In other words, we are trying to mega multitask. Because do I love Jesus? Yes. Do I want to be in God's story completely? Yes. Do I want to see God's kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven? Yes. Do I serve? Yes. Do I give? Yes. All yes. Yes, yes. And this is my church and me at times. I also want season tickets. I also want the best sex with my spouse. I also want more wealth than I need, a, you know, a buffer. I also want a good reputation in the eyes of culture. You know, I also want travel. I also want, you know, good food. I want it all. So I got this thing over here that I want, and then I got a cultural narrative over, over here to defining a good life this way, and then I'm like this. I'm all in for God, all in. Well, except <laughs> for this piece over here. And, you know, if I'm pressed, I would say sometimes I'm trying to have it all. A couple observations. Number one, God's not opposed to tickets and football and travel and culture and food and good sex with your spouse. God, it's all good. But it's never to be pursuit. Seek first what? The kingdom and let God seek this over here and let God take care of. These are gifts. God's going to give you gifts. You'll enjoy them. Give thanks. Hold them with an open hand. But don't, certainly don't seek this. And then watch this. Once you, if God gives you gifts, don't exhaust yourself. Try to hold the whole show together. Because I'm going, to tell, I'm going to tell you, you won't be able to hold it all together. Gifts come and go. There's a, I remember a couple of year, years ago doing, doing their wedding. And uh, <laughs> they, um, she was really worried. We did, a, we did a test. And what shows up in this test that you end up talking about is your anxiety versus calm level, among other things, introvert, extrovert, you know, different things. How anxious are you? You know, her anxiety was way, way up here. You know, so I asked her, I said, hey, what are you anxious about? She said, oh, I'm always anxious, but right now, I'm, you know, I'm anxious about the wedding. Really? Let's talk about that. Oh, will the photographer come on time and the flowers could wilt and it's, you know, it's, supposed to, it's an outdoor venue and this is Seattle, could rain on any day, you know, worry, worry, worry. I said, oh, listen, those are minor worries. Let me give you some stuff to really worry about. <laughs> I said, you know, you're going to get married. Have you thought about this? Which of you is going to die first? Thought about that? Do you want kids? Yeah, we want kids. Well, what if you, don't have, what if you can't have children? Or what if you do worse and then something happens? Is your husband going to be faithful? Are you both going to be walking with God 10 years from now? She, you know, she's shrinking down in her chair. She's got tears in her eyes. Finally, she goes, why are you doing this to me? I said, here's why. I'm trying to show you that control is an illusion. Would you say that with me? Control is an illusion. Like, we don't control our lives. We can build the biggest castle of all. And then the economy goes south or democracy implodes. Whatever. God's still on the throne. You still have a calling to be the presence of Jesus. That never changes. This over here is bomb-proof, man. I can see Christ, love Christ, serve Christ, be filled with Christ, seek first God's kingdom, and then if I'm granted, you know, great food in an Austrian hut as a gift, I'll take it and give thanks. If I'm granted 40 years with my wife, I'll take it and give thanks. If I'm granted 10, I'll give thanks. If I die tomorrow, I'll give thanks. Why? 
this was worth all of it over here. That's the deal. So I don't want to be that soil that's divided. I don't want to be that soil that has a version of suffering and so isn't yoked with Christ. So I've got good news for you. Soil can be fixed. So let's go to the next slide. How do we fix soil? You know, Jeremiah 6.16 says this, uh, seek the ancient paths. Now, here's what we mean by that. In most cultures, uh, there's, there, there are habits that are passed down from, you know, parents to kids that create formation, right? And in most cultures, there's even kind of rites of passage that kind of seal these habits are created. You know, America, if I can be blunt, uh, one of our idols, one of our bales is hyper-individualism. And so we don't pass stuff down. We're like this, oh, oh, you want to find your own way? Oh, oh so good. You know, find, go, find your way. And now, er, you know, everybody's given a blank piece of paper and told, essentially, build your own moral construct, build your own faith, come up with your own value system. There's, a, there's three million self-help books on Amazon. Surely one of them will help you. Go for it. Ha, huh, what a joke. Like Paul says in 2 Timothy 2 to the old guys, hey, the stuff you've learned, pass it on to the next generation so that they'll pass it on to the next generation. So uh, Jeremiah says there are ancient paths. There are habits that keep the soil um, soft and, and nutritious. If you're a farmer, you know exactly what I'm talking about. We're losing 300 soccer fields of soil, topsoil every day across the planet through abusive soil. It's a perfect illustration. Like, we got to care for the soil. So how do we do that? Well, that's, that's where spiritual disciplines come in, actually. And so I'm just going to name a couple of them for us this morning because there are many. I'll just say to you something about spiritual disciplines, first of all, at the umbrella level. Spiritual disciplines <clears throat> are unglorious and slow and anonymous. So, it, like, if you want to care for... Soil work is n unspectacular work, right? This is the stuff that happens in the margins of your life. It happens early in the morning. It happens late at night, perhaps. It happens when you're, you know, when you're driving, you commute. Soil work is un unspectacular, but very important. So here's some soil work. Uh, number one, my hope is that you develop habits of prayer and solitude. Oh, by the way, before we go there, let's go to the next slide for just a second. I have what I call a rule of life worksheet. This is a QR code. You know what that is? I just learned. You can point your phone at that, and that will take you to a rule of life worksheet so that you can develop habits to care for the soil that is your soul, right? Well, I'll just leave that up there for a minute here so you can get that. And if you don't get it, it'll be on this other website that I referenced earlier. But prayer and solitude is the first thing. In Mark 1, 35, Jesus is a, has he's had a long day. You know, he healed some people. He taught. He healed some more people. He went to a house. People followed him to the house. We were trying to get away from it all. And he did more healing, more teaching, cast out some demons, goes to bed, uh, uh, gets up early in the morning, Mark 135, gets up early in the morning and goes and prays. And so then, uh, when he's still out praying in the woods, you know, down by Creek here at Mount Hermon, he's still out praying, and uh, Peter wakes up, and the whole town has come to the door of this house. So J Jesus' ministry, without any social media, went viral. Everybody knew this man is amazing, and everybody brought their sick friends and buddies, and uh, they wanted to hear teaching. The whole town's at the door. Jesus comes in the back door, apparently. Peter is like this, where have you been? Whole town's out front. Subtext, this is the kind of marketing opportunity people dream of, right? This is where we build our base. This is, where, this is where we increase our sphere of influence. This is where we get our platform. Heal a few more here, man. You can write a book. <laughs> what does Jesus say? 
hey, let's get out the back door right now. And he leaves a village of unmet needs. Why? He says, hey, I was, up, I was praying, and the father told me that I have to keep going. And I got to preach in another village, in another village, in another village. I won't meet every physical need. I won't do it. Why? My obedience is not to meeting needs. My obedience is to the crowd. My obedience is to, you know, building influence. My obedience is to the father. Prayer and solitude. I just encourage you to develop a habit of prayer and solitude. Whatever that looks like for you. If you commute, maybe that's your solitude time. But what that means is, you know, turn off whatever it is that you listen to. Audiobooks, NPR, sports radio, whatever, and just pray as you drive for whoever God brings to your mind. Pray for your kids. My, my thought two times in the morning, I do some meditating. And when I'm done meditating and I'm just kind of praying, I pray for people who God brings to mind, some of whom are in this room. Dave Burns is one of them. Mike Rumberg is one. On my inhale, I'll name Mike. On my exhale, I'll say, may, may, may the shalom of God be with Mike today. May the shalom of God be with Dave today. Just pray. Develop the habits of, of prayer and solitude. Second, develop the habits of meditation and Bible reading. Though I won't go into meditation much now because of time. I'll just refer to that book, refer to that book, Forest Faith. But know that meditation, when I say meditation here, I'm not talking about Eastern stuff that uh, tells you to empty your mind. I'm talking about uh, Joshua 1, uh, Psalm 1, Psalm 119, that tells you to fill your mind with what God says to be true, right? The word meditate literally means to chew like a cow chews. And if you know cows, they don't eat once something. They eat, they eat it over and over and over and over again. So find, find a little text and meditate. For example, for me, could be this on a given morning. I'm completing Christ. Inhale. Thank you. Exhale. Completing Christ. Inhale. Thank you. Exhale. Don't get caught up on breath. You don't have to do it that way. But just remind yourself you're completing Christ. You're completing Christ. Eventually, you begin to believe it. You begin to believe that your cup is full. And then you look at the world through a whole different lens. Rather than what can I receive from you, it becomes what can I give you. Why? Because I'm complete. Where would that come from? Uh, the long, boring practice of meditation. Bible reading can be very boring, friends. You, people start in Genesis. It's, as we've seen this week, hysterically entertaining, at least for me. And then you get to Exodus, also pretty cool. Deuteronomy gets a little legalistic. Leviticus is just off the map ridiculous. And then I'm like, why am I reading this, right? That's for many of us. That's what happens. Well, hit, listen, Bible reading is a matter of showing up as a, the, like the same way you show up with your spouse. My wife and I have this habit in the morning of, uh, she, you know, walks with the neighbors. I do sometimes as well. But then when we get back from walking with the neighbors, she'll brew a tea, I'll have my coffee, we'll sit, and we're just going to connect. And, you know, if you connect with your spouse, you know you do this, if you do this, uh, you know that some days are just awesome, you know, it's truth-telling and intimacy and confession, forgiveness. Some days are funny and you're kind of laughing. Some days are hard. And can we just, you know, blunt here? Are some days boring? Don't raise your hand because your spouse is sitting with you. But mine isn't. I'll just say it. Yeah, some days are boring too, right? Because I'll ask about something and my wife being... You know, very, very, more verbal than me, if you can imagine that. Uh, hey, uh, who was with you? That's like a one-word answer. You know, and then I'm like, okay, I'll give you one more of these days, and if it's boring next time, I think I'm done. No, 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 no. Listen, we keep showing up. Why? Because we just know after Leviticus, Tomorrow, God's going to feed me. Or the next day. Just keep showing up. That's my point. Last one. Hospitality. The first four that I gave you were kind of receiving, receiving, receiving. But spiritual disciplines aren't just receiving. They're giving. Hebrews 13.2 says, don't neglect hospitality. We started the week in Genesis 12. 
You are blessed. Why? To be a blessing. We ran a hospitality ministry for seven years up in the, you know, the North Cascades, and we loved it mostly, <laughs> but it was not easy. People came, you know, people came to us from all over the world, uh, and some brought us hope and life, and there were beautiful days when they cooked, for, you know, guests cooked for us and served us, and there were days, there were, you know, there was a woman who came and she lived with us for six weeks. She was demon-possessed and had come out of the satanic church and was a new believer. And, oh, man. But our, we had purposed, God, whoever you bring, we're going to serve them in the name of Jesus. Right? Uh, in that vein, I was so touched recently by reading a story. I began the week by uh, mentioning David Brooks and his response to Russell Moore's question on a podcast, David Brooks being the conservative at the New York Times. David's written a book entitled The Second Mountain, which, by the way, includes his testimony moving from uh, his growing up Jewish to being a Christ follower. But let, me just read, let me just read a little paragraph here or two about hospitality from David Brooks' book. Kathy Fletcher and David Simpson have a son named Santi, goes to public school in D.C. Santi had a friend named James who sometimes went to bed hungry, so Santi invited uh, him to occasionally sleep over at his house. James had a friend, and that kid had a friend, and so on. And now, if you go to Kathy and David's house on any given Thursday night, there'll be 25 or 30 kids sitting around the dinner table <laughs> every Thursday. And then here's Brooks. I started going to dinner at Kathy and David's house sometime in early 2014, invited by a mutual friend. I walked in the door. I was greeted by a tall, charismatic man named Ed. He had dreadlocks dripping over his soulful eyes. I held out my hand to shake his hand. Ed said, we don't shake hands here. Bring it in. We hug. I'm not naturally a huggy guy, but so began what has been for me so far five years of hugging. Every Thursday. This story so moves me because of the brokenness of young people in America. But just listen. We nominally gather around the table to eat. <laughs> but in reality, we gather to feed a deeper hunger. Cell phones are banned. You drop them in a thing when you come in, a bucket. About a third of the way through the meal, we go around the table. Each person says something they're grateful for and something nobody knows about them or some other piece of information. There are frequent celebrations. Somebody passed the GED. Somebody got a job. Somebody graduated from barber school. There are also more complicated things at the table, too. A 17-year-old is dealing with a pregnancy. Another young woman has a failing kidney, and Medicaid refuses to pay the cost of a new one. A young man announces that he's confused about his sexual identity. Another admits he's depressed. One day, a new arrival sits at the table and says she is 21 years old, and she hadn't sat at a dinner table since she was 11. I brought my daughter one day says Brooks. She walked out. She said, that's the warmest place I've ever been in my life. Brooks continues, I've, I've learned to never underestimate the power of the dinner table. It's the stage on which we turn toward one another for love, <laughs> like flowers seeking the sun. One woman said, thank you for seeing the light in me. These adults who are at the table come from emotionally avoidant world in Washington, D.C., and they get to shed their armor. The kids come from the streets. Kids around the table have been through the normal traumas of poverty, some homeless, some travel through the foster care system. The theme of male cruelty runs through their histories, abusive fathers, absent fathers, but they're enmeshed now in a family. One man, a sociologist, came one night with David. This is what he said. I've been working in this field for 50 years, and I can tell you I've never seen a program turn around a life. This is what America needs. Is that what he said? That's what he said. And, you know, I've heard David speak on this. And he would say, you go around the table as well, and here's what you got. You got Republicans. You got Libertarians. You got Trump fans. You got anti-Trump fans. You got Biden fans. You got socialists, you got communists, you got gay, you got straight, you got Christian, you got Muslim, you got atheist. You got everybody. 
But listen, they're all being loved in Jesus' name. Man. Let's just ask the question. That's one table in one city. What if out of Mount Hermon, just 10 tables happened when you go home? What if that happened? Change the country. <laughs> Certainly change your neighborhood. At least change you. Soil care for the soul. That's what we need. So I'm going to ask Dave to come up, and he's going to play a little bit and sing a little bit. But as we close, here's the, here's the deal. It's, it's vital that we kind of embrace all of us at the end of the week the next step. I don't know what the next step is going to be for you, but we've gone through things this week. Is my cup full? Am I living out of a place of fullness or emptiness? Am I all in? Have I blown it? Do I need to return to God? Do I, do I need to take a step uh, in silence or solitude or prayer or meditation? Is there something I need to confess to my spouse? Do my spouse and I together want to take one little tiny step toward hospitality and invite the neighbors over? I'm just going to invite you, before they sing, they're going to do a little instrumental, but before they sing, I'm going to invite you to ask this question. God, what's my next step? And if you're here together as a couple, feel free to pray together as a couple. Just hold hands and pray or whatever you do. But pray for a next step. And if God's already shown you a next step, please share it with your spouse. It would break my heart if this week is only inspirational, not transformational. The point isn't to come and hear stuff and laugh and cry and leave. And then again, curse traffic. The point is to leave with your cup filled so that you can pour it out and bless our world. Jesus, speak to us now as we listen for your voice and listen for next steps. And we'll thank you. In Christ's name we pray.